Thanks so much, Professor Roberts, not only for that wonderful introduction, but also for the opportunity to be able to come here and to be able to talk to you today about something that I think is much more important than what people most often pay much attention to. Uh, I have one fairly simple goal here, which is to try to make a case that paying attention to things like the marriage system is something that we need to rediscover, that it's, it's fallen out of favor. If I were to start a talk by saying, I'm going to talk about personnel policy, uh, in most cases, most of the time, the room would empty, or the people who would be left would be sitting there with their eyes glazing over, nodding off into a nap very quickly. But I want to try, as my only main goal here today, to try to convince you that that would be a mistake, because the issues are fundamentally important. And what I want to try to do is to spin off a new book I'm working on that's entitled Escaping Jurassic Government, uh, which is a title in part to try to give me an excuse to put some dinosaurs on the cover, mm -hmm. and in part to try to make an argument that governments that fail to adapt end up risking the same thing that happened to dinosaurs. And there's nothing more fundamental to that than rediscovering America's lost commitment to competence, as the subtitle of this new book describes. What I want to try to do is to argue how important the role of people in government is in making sure that American government, governments around the world for that matter, don't go the way of the dinosaurs. To do that though, what I want to try to do is not talk about personnel policy, not talk about the civil service, at least right away, because I don't want to start off by emptying the room, but I want to try to make an argument about why it matters, why it matters politically and why it matters in terms of overall policy. It didn't take too long after Governor Scott Walker left the presidential race for the issues about what to do with government workers in Wisconsin to surface very quickly. Within days of leaving the race, he went back to Madison and announced a fundamental reform, he said, of the state's hiring system. What he planned to do was, among other things, to centralize control over the hiring process in a state-based agency. He planned to make it easier, he said, to hire people by doing away with the long tradition of the written sit-down exam for civil service positions and to replace that with a resume-based process. He said he wanted to make it easier to fire people who were clearly responsible for poor performance and bad behavior. And it turns out that within a day or two, a group that was funded by the Koch brothers immediately issued a press release saying what a great idea this was. If you know Wisconsin, if you've been following what's been going on in Wisconsin, you know that there's tremendous amounts of political battle and conflict over some of the positions that the governor's been taking. And liberals were suspicious given the governor's previous assault on public employee unions, where his basic goal was to try to, to kneecap the groups that had been most responsible for supporting Democrats who were most responsible for fighting against Republicans for a generation. So he went after them and won. And so now, as he has this new proposal for what he calls civil service reform, the first reaction on the part of a lot of liberals, a lot of Democrats was, what's he up to? Uh, how's he gonna try to use this to get at us. There was an immediate assumption that whatever was going on was politically motivated. It was only underlined and aggravated by the fact that a Koch Brothers funded group immediately came out in favor of it. But the one thing that's clear here is that it's pretty clear that some of what it is that goes on in the way we hire and deal with government employees is simply out of sync with what we need. They have cases that they pointed to in Wisconsin with uh, government employees who were watching pornography on state computers. And he said, it took us a year and a half to fire people like that. He said, that's ridiculous. He said, we have tests that no longer do a very good job of measuring the kind of skills that are needed to try to hire the people that the government needs. We need to reform that. And it's hard to argue against it. What we have at the core is clear evidence that we have an existing system of hiring and promoting and motivating government employees that's out of sync with the needs of what the government has today at the same time that there's growing suspicion that efforts to try to reform it are politically motivated, which is leading on the one hand to more attacks by conservatives on the underlying principles, and on the other hand, increasing defense on the part of those representing public employees, especially public employee unions, saying 
this is all politically motivated, we have to stop it at all costs. So what we've ended up with, who could possibly imagine the way politics in America works these days, is an issue that's increasingly polarized, where we have conservatives on one side, liberals on the other, and with a middle ground that is not staked out and not clear. The people say, well, the, we clearly need reforms, but it's not a fundamental assault on the merit system itself. And in fact, if you read the commentaries to the piece that I wrote, you'll see that there are a fair number of people who have said, nobody would really reasonably disagree with the basic principles of the civil service system. But what I want to suggest is, oh yes, they will. Because we are fundamentally talking about what it is that we want for the people who work for government to deliver services to us. How deep and fundamental is this? In 28 states right now, there is a movement to do away with traditional civil service protections and to move to some form of at-will employment. That is, making it possible to be able to fire public employees at will without having to go through the usual kinds of protections. Now you can debate whether or not that's reform, whether or not it's some effort to try to deal with the fundamental principle, but what I want to suggest is the basic question of on what basis should we hire people to work for government? On what basis should we maintain them in their jobs? What kind of performance should we expect? How should we get rid of them if they don't perform? Those questions are under as fundamental assault as there has been in the history of the civil service system. And what's happening is this debate is underway, and what I want to suggest too on top of that is that, at least in the academic world, there are very few people paying careful attention. And I think there's a chance that we could wake up discovering that big, fundamental, huge, wrenching changes have been made while we weren't looking at what the long-run implications were. Now, if you look at the history of all this stuff, what's remarkable, given the partisanship now, is how bipartisan the original Civil Service Act was. The, the base piece of legislation, the fundamental foundation on which everything was built, was the Pendleton Civil Service Act back in 1883. And George Pendleton was a senator who actually had a previous history. He ran as an anti-war candidate, vice presidential candidate, against Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War and lost, but went off to become a Democratic senator. And in the aftermath of the presidential assassination of President Garfield, Chester Ar A. Arthur signed a piece of legislation that Pendleton authored. So we have a Republican president signing a piece of legislation that was authored by a Democratic senator and created the foundation of the civil service as we know it today. What's required, if you are any kind of scholar in the field, to say that it was a product of a reform proposal that was necessitated by a disappointed office seeker. You're not allowed to discuss civil service reform without having disappointed office seeker as part of this, but it had to do fundamentally with an idea of hiring people on the basis of merit, promoting them on the basis of performance, freeing them from political interference, and promoting high quality government work. And it's something that Democrats and Republicans, despite all their other disagreements, for 130 years advocated, promoted, and advanced until today. But it's, on the other hand, easy to understand why people could fall out of love with something that had been in business for 130 years because first it's, it's pretty clear that the system that we have now is a mess. If there's any great bipartisan consensus in the states at the local level, at the federal level right now, it's that our civil service system is broken. I mean, it's, it's inflexible, it's hard to get at, it's rule bound, it protects poor performers. It, it is clear that it's difficult to try to eliminate people who work for government and perform badly. It is true that there have been cases with people who have done things clearly bad, like watching pornography on government computers that it turns out to be hard to eliminate out of the government service. It's clear the system is broken. And here's the debate that I want to try to stage. Clear we need to fix it, but what are the basic fundamental principles that in the process we need to try to pursue? And what I want to suggest is that those principles themselves, even beyond the fixes, are fundamentally, fundamentally at, at risk. Now, if you say, okay, what I want to try to do is to get a job working for government, uh, I've had increasing conversations with students saying, look, I just, it's just frustrating. I'm trying to figure out where the jobs are, 
what my chances are of being able to get a job, figuring out how to negotiate the process of getting in, especially at the federal level, and that's even understanding whether or not there are jobs that are hiring freezes or openings or other things that I could try to pursue. Uh, we have larger numbers of students graduating from programs in public affairs who have decided that, you know what, I want to try to do good, but I will do good by taking jobs outside government. I'm going to go work for a nonprofit. Or maybe I'll start a nonprofit. Maybe I can get a job in the private sector because at least they'll make a decision in a reasonable period of time. That the difficulty of simply negotiating the process is driving people out of the pursuit of government service at the very time when government itself is looking so inflexible and not very much fun to work in that it's hard to encourage people to try to engage in that. Now, to be sure, there are increasing places where you can do public service outside of government because there are more places outside of government that are doing government's work through contracts and other kinds of mechanisms. But the fundamental question is, who is at home to make sure that it's the public interest that's being served? And that's the question that is fundamentally at the core. Getting into government is increasingly hard to negotiate. And then there's the question of getting rid of poor performers. We all know, of course, because we've read it in the newspapers over and over again, that it's impossible in government to get rid of poor performers. And then in the private sector, they're much easier, much better, much more effective at cleaning house. Well, is that true? And the answer is, well, it turns out to be yes. There are more protections in government for people who perform poorly, in part because for 130 years we've decided that we want to make sure that it's not super easy when a new party comes in to clean house and to try to fire people who were left over from the previous administration with whom the new administration might disagree, or at least might want to not take any chances about. So it turns out, yes, it is harder because we've decided for 130 years, Republicans and Democrats alike, we want to try to reduce the odds of political interference in the way that the government's work gets done. Because there are a lot of things that government does. This is not a Republican or Democratic way of dealing with air traffic control. This is not a Republican or Democratic way of paying Social Security checks. This is not a Republican or Democratic way of hiring, one hopes, professors who teach in public universities. Although I've been told that there is a Republican or Democratic way of plowing snow in Chicago, I had somebody told me that once upon a time that they had moved into a new neighborhood and it was one of these big Chicago snowstorms and the snow plow came down from one side of the street and left a big pile of snow, came down the other side and left a big pile of snow that left the person hemmed in. So he called on the phone and talked to the Public Works Department and said, some kind of problem has happened because you haven't plowed in front of my house. And the answer was, we know. Next time you buy a house, be careful who you live next to. Because it turns out the person next to him was a member of the city council that the mayor was feuding with. And they made a point of making sure that that person was stuck. There can be Democratic or Republican ways of plowing snow, but there's an underlying sense that, you know, when it comes to basic public services, that partisan questions should not interfere with the way that basic services are being delivered. That's a only in Chicago kind of story that one would hope, in general terms, wouldn't be repeated elsewhere. So is it possible to fire people who work for government? The answer is yes. And in fact, if you look at statistics, the, and only look at people who are fired for disciplinary and performance reasons, because it's important in the private sector to rule out seasonal employment, people who work for amusement parks during the summer but are laid off because of seasonal work, people who come and work for department stores during the holidays and then are laid off afterwards because of that. Look at only people who are laid off or fired for disciplinary and performance reasons on an annual basis, according to government statistics, it's about 1% in the private sector. In the federal government overall, it's about 0.4%. So in fact, the rate is lower. Is that so far out of whack that you'd be surprised by that? And the answer is, given the fact that there are protections against political interference, that's not wildly out of sync. There are increasing criticisms now that the Department of Veterans Affairs is just completely out of control, that veterans are showing up, needing appointments, and not being scheduled, that there's a new story out that suggests that in some cases veterans are not being the, given the kind of care that they deserve because doctors are going off and showing up for appointments, checking off the appointment, having been completed before they even saw the patient. 
So it's clear that there are problems inside the VA, so people, especially on the right, are arguing that we need to fix that problem by making it easier to fire poor performers in the VA, and that the way to fix the VA is to fire more people faster. And if you're not going to fire them, we're going to make you fire them. Reforms are based on trying to eliminate people who are poor performers. So it turns out that in the VA, the rate of firing for disciplinary and performance reasons is 0.75% versus 1% in the private sector. So the numbers are not wildly out of sync. Or put differently, it's hard to imagine that we could solve government's most basic performance problems simply by firing at the level at which the private sector does. So if we were to fire a few more people, what would we do? The answer is we would simultaneously undermine the traditional protections against political interference, not make a very big difference in the workforce overall, signal to every public employee that their jobs are under assault, and make it even harder to recruit people to do government's work. That, I think, constitutes a fundamental assault on the merit system principle. So to unpack this, I want to look at four things in particular that I discuss in the commentary that I wrote for governance. Four basic reasons why I think the principle itself is under assault. First, we've lost the balance between protections and holding people accountable. And I think here, clearly, the answer is yes. That what's happened is that we have civil service protections that have grown up in a way that have become increasingly rule-bound, to the point that it's hard to hire people. It's hard to fire people. Not impossible, and not as hard as we might think, but at least it's hard, most fundamentally, to match the protections and the ideas that we have against the need to try to hold the system accountable. If you look at the challenges that the Department of Veterans Affairs in particular is facing, the basic argument that's being made, in part because it becomes very hard for critics of the VA to look more deeply at what's really going on, the fundamental argument that's being made is that, you know what the problem is? The problem is we have poor performers, and the solution is to try to fire them. And that's being framed on Capitol Hill as an argument about accountability. So we've gotten from veterans waiting too long for appointments, being scheduled for appointments and not having those appointments delivered, about poor quality of care, about whistleblowers suggesting gaming and the way in which the performance measures are collected, all this put together, clear problems inside the VA. It's been framed as a problem of accountability. Not a performance so much, but of accountability, where the nature of the civil service per system is creating protections that the argument is increasingly from the right in particular that the problem is a lack of accountability. And the problem is a lack of accountability, then the solution is to try to improve accountability. And how would one improve accountability but to fire them? And if there's not enough accountability, then fire more of them. And if accountability isn't coming fast enough, fire them faster. And what's happening on top of that, make no mistake about it, is that this effort to try to change the nature and the balance between protections against political interference on the one side and efforts to try to improve performance on the other, having to do with the VA in particular, is just a stalking horse for a much broader effort to try to change the ways in which those protections operate across government as a whole. That this is an effort to try to change the protections for senior managers and for individual government employees that once changed in a very large agency will make it possible to do it for other agencies as well. In the very same way that Scott Walker's efforts in Wisconsin is part of a broader movement in the states where 28 states have now moved away from traditional protections toward more efforts at at will employment. Make no mistake, this is something fundamental that's going on. It's going on in a way that disguises the nature of the underlying issues because, I mean, who could possibly defend a system that doesn't provide veterans with the care that they earn, that we've promised, and that they deserve? And when it's clear that government employees are not doing that, it is a fundamental problem and needs a fundamental attack, but what's happened is it's been framed as a fundamental attack on those employees. Behind all of this, however, is something that's a very complicated set of back-channel politics where conservative right-wing 
interest groups have been f created and funded by conservative, right-wing, very well-heeled individuals. Especially in the case of the VA, there's an organization called the Concerned Veterans for America, which has been created, funded by right-wing interests to stage an attack against the VA itself and to make it easier to fire VA employees, to try then to change the VA from a system of government-provided, government-funded health care to a system of vouchers that will allow individual employees, individual veterans to be able to take their vouchers and receive care from anyone inside the VA or not as a way to try to undermine government provision of services, as a way to try to shrink one of the largest government agencies, as a way to try to make a case for cutting back civil service protections more broadly by making it easier to fire people in the VA and creating a case for doing that in other agencies as well, as a way ultimately to try to defund Obamacare by transforming it into a privatized system to increase the level of vouchers. Uh, this may seem like a kind of broad conspiracy, but in fact, according to research that I've done, is in fact what's happening. And on the other hand, there are liberal groups who are saying that we're not going to allow this to happen. And so they've created their own front groups whose goal is to try to counter the conservative front groups. Behind all the basic questions about what are we going to do about the VA are much more fundamental battles being fought between the right and the left by proxy front groups whose basic question is about the size of government, the role of government employees, the protections that are going to be given to government employees, how broadly the civil service system ought to be reformed and what to do about it. And all of this is happening largely out of public view, being fought by proxy groups through proxy issues. That, I believe, is a fundamental question about the role of merit and merit hiring in the federal government. And because there's little research being done about it, very little investigative reporting, in fact, being done about it, we are very likely to wake up with a fundamental change about all these issues without our ever having thought it through. We clearly need fundamental reforms, but what's happening is that what we're likely to end up with is likely to be the product of these proxy battles without a question of what kind of workforce do we need for the kind of government we want to deliver. There's a disconnection between the mission and the reforms because the basic reforms are being battled out by proxy groups funded by individuals and by groups that have much larger things at stake. So, we've lost the battle, I think, in many ways between thinking about protections and performance and accountability because it's been transformed into another set of issues when we weren't looking. The second thing that's going on is this basic question about whether or not cutting the number of employees would it really cut the size of government. And here is a fascinating kind of question because one of the re ways that these proxy battles are being fought out is that there's an underlying piece that if you cut the number of government employees and make it easier to fire government employees, you can reduce the size of government. One of the things that has happened increasingly though is that the size of government has been disconnected from the actual number of government employees performing government's work, especially at the federal level. Now, at the local level, we have teachers who teach and sanitation workers who pick up garbage and plow snow. But at the federal level in particular, it's increasingly a large mechanism of proxy activities where the government has a fairly small number of employees that leverage enormous amounts of money. I've had a chance to talk with some of the students, and my single favorite statistic about the entire federal government is that Medicare and Medicaid combined account for 20% of all federal spending, but that 20% of federal spending is managed by 0.2% of all federal employees, such that the typical person receiving benefits of Medicare and Medicaid, two of the largest programs in the federal government, never encounter a government employee. What we have is a problem where we're trying to do government on the cheap, it turns out that one out of every 10 Medicare dollars is spent in improper payments. It's hard for us to do much about that because we have an agency of only about 5,000 people in charge of managing 20% of the entire federal budget. And as a result of that, this program, these two programs are on the Government Accountability Office's high risk list of programs most, fraud, most prone to fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement because there's nobody home in sufficient numbers to be able to manage the program sufficient to be able to prevent that from happening. So we could further reduce the number of employees, and what we would do by doing that is to increase the odds that these programs would be subject to waste, fraud, and abuse, and mismanagement. 
in the middle of the political campaign right now, there are arguments for eliminating the Department of Energy. Let's try to shrink the size of the federal government because what's the Department of Energy? It's a group of people trying to convince everybody to put solar panels on the roofs. And we don't want to engage in that kind of policy making. But the reality is that 90% of the entire Department of Energy budget is spent on contracts. And what the contractors do is research, development, and maintenance of the, na of the nation's nuclear force. The Pentagon manages the weapons once they're built. The Department of Energy is in charge of creating and maintaining them. And by the way, cleaning up the legacy of the last 70 years of environmental damage that we've done by making the nuclear weapons to begin with. To the point, as I told some of the students earlier, that there was a place once where they created the triggers for nuclear weapons that are about the size of a basketball. But there was so much environmental pollution around that if you put a Geiger counter against the prairie dog in the neighborhood, it would click off the scale. And the locals called them hot dogs because of the level of radioactive, radioactive contamination that they were subject to. That's what the Department of Energy does. So by reducing the number of employees, you're not going to be able to really reduce the size of government. And case after case after case, we find the same kind of problem, that there is a disconnection between the size of government question and the role of government employees. And the role of government employees at the federal level increasingly is not to deliver services, but to manage the people who do and by cutting the number of government employees, what we simply do is to reduce our ability to be able to deliver government effectively and to increase the potential for waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. There's one presidential candidate who said what we want to do is to try to, to cut down the number of government employees by not replacing anybody who retires until we hit a desired target. That makes me nervous about ready to get on an airplane this afternoon because half of all the air traffic controllers are now scheduled to retire. And if we didn't replace any of them, the odds of my being able to get to where I want to go safely and on time shrink dramatically. We just don't have a very good idea about how to think about the size of government and the number of government employees, because the number of government employees at the federal level has become increasingly disconnected from government size. And on top of that, a little known fact is that the change in the number of government employees over the last generation has been essentially zero. We still have about the same number of feds that we had then. We are spending vastly more money, and it's because more feds are responsible increasingly for more amounts of money. The people who work for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, people who manage Medicare and Medicaid, on average, each individual employee is responsible for $144 million of spending. Each individual employee on average. So if we're going to reduce the number of government employees, every employee we reduce puts another $144 million at risk. There's a wild disconnection between the size of government and the number of government employees. And a small footnote to that, of course, is that the agency that was in charge of building the Obamacare website and that had difficulty in delivering was, of course, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is already struggling to try to manage the programs that it's got. It's a little surprise that it had some difficulty, which then gets to my third point. Again, remind, remind that the first point was a lost balance between protections and accountability. Second point is about the size of government and the connection between what government does and the people who do it on behalf of government. The third is that government employees are becoming an increasingly big target for government bashers. Now, we need a fundamental question and a fundamental debate about the role and the size of government. There's a very good argument that the left has created a government too big to be able to manage, and that the right is having a recognition of that, but arguing to try to cut government in a way that will make it harder to manage. That neither side is really grappling these questions well. But rather than have that debate, which frankly, politically, is much too hard to do, it's much easier to look at government employees as the target over which these battles are fought. So we have a problem with the VA. The VA is a huge agency full of enormous problems. During the 1990s, it was recognized as one of the government's best managed agencies. And during the 2000s, it ended up in incredible problems, in part because of difficulties in leadership, but also, frankly, because it went from a, an agency focused mainly on geriatric care for veterans of World War II and Korea and Vietnam, and doing that pretty well, to having to do that and simultaneously then having to take on the challenges of veterans who were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan Surviving injuries in the previous wars might have killed them. Being subjected in much larger quantities 
to injuries from weapons that nobody anticipated, these improvised explosive devices that turned out to have lots of long-term consequences, and a war that went on much longer than anybody anticipated. So the VA all of a sudden, without any ability to be able to plan, found itself having to deal with both constituencies at the same time, and it's been struggling since to try to figure out how to deal with it. So you take an agency that's struggling trying to figure out how to manage such an incredibly complex problem, and it has difficulties in trying to figure out how to do that. When it has problems, what better to do than to blame the employees? Because we don't want to have to have a debate over government size, about the role of the VA, about the balance between vouchers and a direct care provision, because we can't have that directly. So we'll attack the employees who deliver the services. Why? Because they're there, they're handy, and who's going to defend somebody who cooks the books in Phoenix about the number of veterans who are being seen? So it makes a great target, makes for great headlines, and makes for great awards for journalists, and has only that much to do with the nature of the problem. But when we can't deal with the fundamental policy debates, attacking government employees makes a really great proxy target instead. Which gets to my fourth point. One of the things that we need, and we are not having, is a connection between what kind of government service we need to do the job that we expect government to do. Now that would seem like a pretty straightforward question, but it turns out that we don't have that debate very often because there's, and this is a, a truly embarrassing, ultimately frightening statement, but there is very, very little, almost no one in Washington in particular at the federal level looking about the connections between human capital needs on the one side and the missions that agencies need to accomplish on the other. What are we going to do about these air traffic controllers? Because it turns out, as I said, that half of them are eligible to retire. We need to try to replace them. And they're going to be stepping into a vastly different kind of system where more airplanes are going to be self-controlling to try to reduce congestion in the airspace. How are we going to do that? I looked at the Government Accountability Office of the 32 programs that are on their high-risk list of programs most prone to fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement. The, the, the 32 are the worst of the worst. And asked, what is it that they have in common? What are the programs in the federal government most prone to fraud, waste, and abuse? What do they have in common? They range all the way from the, the problem uh, that we have with weather satellites, which is a hidden issue, because some of them may go dark, to the ongoing problems of Medicare and Medicaid, to issues of defense procurement. And it turns out that of these 32 programs, 25 of the 32 have problems managing boundaries, which is not surprising because almost everything that matters in government has to do with connections among agencies and with private contractors. 23 of the 32 have problems with performance metrics. 18 of the 32 have to do explicitly with getting the right skill sets for people in government to do the job. And if you step back and think, all of these are basically people problems because the boundary management questions really have to do with managers who are smart enough to understand how to make the connections with contractors, how to make the connections with other agencies, how to make the connections with the people who are actually responsible for sharing with them the delivery of services to citizens. So it turns out that we not only have a debate right now about undermining the merit system, at the same time the government performance problems are growing and it's clear that government's performance problems are growing because we are not thinking very carefully about the skills of the people who are needed to do what it is that government needs to get done. So I said four basic questions. Loss of balance between protections and accountability. Size of government questions and disconnection between the size of government and the people who work for it. Using government employees as a proxy target for political battles. And a disconnection between the, the mission inside agencies and the kind of civil service that we need, which is getting to a fifth question, which is the role of bureaucracy in society. We all hate bureaucracy. We all hate bureaucrats. It's an easy, cheap kind of thing. It's easy to think about this as something new, but for those of you who are scholars of the Bible, it's worth going back and asking yourself, who was the least popular of Jesus' disciples? And the answer, of course, for those of you who know your New Testament, is that it was Matthew the tax collector. Matthew the bureaucrat. We've always hated bureaucrats. It goes back because 
we don't like people who exercise power over us on behalf of everyone else. We have difficult times balancing our own individual self-interest out with the public interest. And it's not just a, a more recent problem. It goes back as long as there have been people who are trying to exercise their collective interest over everybody else. But we've got a real problem here now because we don't really much understand what it is we want government to do. We certainly haven't lost any appetite for government's power. I mean, I fully expect that the TSA is going to treat me well when I go through their line and not subject me to some kind of horrendous search in the back room. I certainly expect that I'm not going to have to wait in line for hours to be able to get through. I expect that the air traffic controllers are going to find a way to get my plane safely to where it is I want to go. I expect that if there are problems with contaminated food in the supermarket, that people will get contaminated food off and find out the source so it's not going to be repeated. I expect that if an alarm goes off and there's a fire outside, the fire department will get here instantly to, to take care of it. And I will tell you from personal experience, I had a case about 10 years ago where I had my own personal medical emergency and uh, we had to call for 911. And when you're lying on the floor waiting for the ambulance to come, it can't possibly come fast enough. When you hear that siren, it's not getting close enough nearly fast enough. Always expect high qualities of service carefully and quickly. But we're not very good about asking ourselves honestly, what government do we want, how much government will we pay for, and what is it going to take to get it? That has to do fundamentally with the debate about the role of the state and the role of our relationship to the state and what it is that we want government to do. So for people who think this business about personnel policy and civil service is really dull and boring, and I applaud most of you because almost nobody's really left so far, I think these basic questions about the role of government, government employees, the civil service, are fundamental, not only fundamental to the performance of government, but they're fundamental to the basic ideological debates that are going on between liberals and conservatives in this country. Except that we're not engaging it. We're not engaging it as a country about how to deliver the government that we want. But I will also say, uh, within our field, that we're not really engaging it much as well on an intellectual basis. There was a time when no self-serving, self-important, important to contribute school of public affairs could possibly exist without a couple people looking at public personnel policy in the civil service, but it's very hard to find anybody doing that today. There was a time when some of the leading figures in the field were focusing on some of these questions, and it's very hard to find that today. There was a time when the basic questions about government performance were front and center, but it's very hard to find that today. And my concern about this is that these issues, I think, are probably pretty important. I think they're pretty fundamental. I think they're in the process of being debated, and they're in the process of being resolved without the participation of the people who've spent generations building a field of study which has the most to contribute to how to try to sort these out. That, I think, is a problem, and it's a problem that we can do something about. Because we are talking about what is the role of the state? How should the state mechanisms be organized to try to deliver services on behalf of citizens? How can citizens hold them accountable? How can we try to maximize performance? How can we ensure trust in public institutions for the way in which we deliver? And how can we ensure high quality services for the money that taxpayers are spending? These are pretty important things. But for the most part, they're rooted deeply into questions of human capital and personnel and civil service that far too many scholars, far too many schools of public affairs, and the discipline as a whole have increasingly neglected. And even you'll see in some of the responses to my commentary, there are people who are saying, well, these are big issues, but they're not really about the fundamentals of the merit system itself, to which I disagree. Because I think we're talking about what is it that we want from government, and what are we prepared to do to make sure that we get it? And how can we do it in a way that is accountable and free from political interference in a way that creates a high quality government for a very long time? Those, I think, put the question and the fundamentals of merit absolutely at the core. Those issues have never been more important. They are under fundamental assault, fundamental re-examination. They will be resolved. They will may be resolved by highly funded front groups on ideological bases, fighting proxy battles, which we don't engage. Or they may involve some of us 
trying to engage some of these fundamental questions because they have things, nothing to do with some of the most fundamental questions about our field and about our system of government. Now, I actually think, and I applaud you for not getting up and leaving, because I think these questions are pretty important. And the ones to which our field can contribute and for which I hope our field will devote much more effort and energy than it has, because otherwise these questions one way or another will be resolved, but I hope they'll be resolved with the impact of the kind of insights we can bring.